feel like I have to whisper now. Uh, so essentially, this is about community health and vulnerability mitigation. And one of the things that has become really sort of um, flavor forward in open source in the last year, year and a half, are the dependencies that are related to projects. And the, the problem or the challenge for open source is that, first of all, identifying what all the dependencies in any given project are, and then deciding how far down the dependency chain We do have folks on the back end, actually. What? We do have folks on the back end now. Yeah. Um, can you turn down the volume a little bit? Sorry? Can you turn down the volume a little bit? It's, I think I'm almost causing feedback for myself. <laughs> OK, that's, that's probably better. Um, so effectively, anytime you're importing something or have a dependency, Often there are then transitive dependencies and tertiary dependencies and circular dependencies where that sometimes exist. And so managing this is important because software vulnerabilities are injected in each of these things that I depend on and maintaining an awareness of where I'm possibly going to have a dependency and where an actually explicit vulnerability is, is, is important. And if, so just knowing your vulnerability is often very difficult because these dependencies are not easily surfaced or visible. No, does everybody agree with that? Or okay, so kind of the birds of a feather is looking to brainstorm about where or how we can um, you know start to address this challenge in a in a way that isn't utterly overwhelming. Um, I know, for example, on the Zephyr project and in some of the embedded systems. They're building um, software, builds the material right into the way that the code is compiled. So you have a very complete inventory of everything, both at, com at uh, development time and at runtime. But most open source is not um, held to that level of safety critical, safety criticality. And so we have to go back and sort of try to discover what our dependencies are. Um, so the things that we've started to use with chaos are uh, a metric called upstream dependencies, which are essentially, these are the dependencies that your project has on other projects. Um, we also use a metric called Libier, which is um, how old is the I'm not. I'm, I, I may be running air traffic control for the airport right now. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> So Libier is, you know, so if a library was released yesterday and the version that you have was released two weeks ago, then your library, your version would have a 13-day Libier calculation. So how far, how old is the version that you're using of a library compared with the most recently released version? Is, is that's, and so that is a useful heuristic measure for, you know, do I have a lot of out-of-date dependencies? The more out-of-date dependencies you have, more likely you are to have a vulnerability that's in your code somewhere. Um, and obviously there's a vulnerabilities list, but a lot of projects aren't paying close attention to that. And then there's also the OSSF scorecard. OSSF. I feel like there's, I always feel like I say too many S's or not enough S's. Um, the scorecard, which we've implemented, and we use that to get a sense of how rigorous the different components of our project are and the different components of the projects that our project depends on are. And that's, um, that's also a useful measure to try to get our heads around this dependency problem. But the, the core challenge kind of is, um, is from this sort of set of complex interdependencies that exist. And so I'm just curious, uh, how do you think about these problems or how do you think about addressing these problems um, on the projects that you participate in? Uh, so, I'm looking at some DevOps metrics. DevOps? Yes. Okay. And maybe there are some of the capabilities that include dependencies that can help to measure. So, uh, it's 
it's another uh, the in, in DevOps metrics you try to measure the performance of the software delivery, and then you measure in terms of the technical capabilities. And one of the some of the technical capabilities include testing the dependencies. So it's uh, maybe we could look at the uh, Dora research program that has a lot of the technical capabilities of DevOps. It's from Google. Okay. And then they have some metrics for dependencies. That is not only measured, measuring uh, the, the dependencies itself, like the, the amount of dependencies. It's like what, how do you deal with the dependencies? When do you test? What do you do with the test? What, what triggers the tests of dependencies? So maybe those kind of uh, dealing with the dependencies metrics can help you to analyze the risk of the, having the dependencies because the dependencies will exist. So maybe only measuring the amount of dependencies is not going to bring you uh, good understanding of the risks. You know? right. Maybe m measuring how do you deal with the dependencies can mm -hmm. add you more value to like compose an understanding of the vulnerabilities. You when, you, when you, from a DevOps perspective, I'm not a DevOps person. Um, I have no, a it's it's idea. okay. Um, I, I, forget the DevOps things. It's, it's like I just wanted to bring where did it come from. But it's like it's the idea of understanding how the team manage the dependencies and not only measuring the dependencies itself, the number of dependencies. So when you say the manage them, like one of the things that's come up in the discussions we've had on the chaos project are open source program offices, for example, mm -hmm. they don't want to be overly restrictive of what dependencies a development team can incorporate, but they also want to try to build an awareness that each time that you include a new dependency, you're creating something that has to be checked and managed and some effort ideally would be made to know that that dependency, for example, is a going concern. So and it's in this line, yes, it's okay. exactly this. And instead of only measuring the amount of dependence, you measure the practices that the team do with the dependence. So How, when do they test? How mm -hmm. do they do that? What, what triggers the test? What do they do after the test, the dependency, you know? Yeah, um, when you say test, can, do you mean just an ordinary software test and that it passes with a dependency in it and a, a new version, or go ahead. Yeah. I have an idea related to what Bianca was saying. So things like the depend about and, and other kinds yeah. of bots, right? Like can you measure your dependencies and if they have a depend about kind of thing, how quickly they close those pull requests and things mm -hmm. like that. So you can actually measure how actively they're maintaining their own dependencies, which are those tertiary, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good that's a good idea. So look at the depend upon depend about pull requests. I, know. I, I know like on Augur I get depend about alerts all the time and off I would say maybe maybe half of the time, give or take 10%, there's a fix that won't break anything else. But the other side of that coin, half, give or take 10% is there's actually a substantial amount of work because the dependency change introduces breaking changes. Um, that's especially problematic on, in different ecosystems. Uh, for, I mean, I'm sure you've all seen this. In NPM, breaking changes seem like almost automatic with any dependent bot update. Um, Python environments, less so. Um, so it's very, it seems very ecosystem specific. Um, I, like, I like that idea. Of course, the project has to has depend about turned on, but which is it still optional? I know I, I like signed up for it like voluntarily, but I know also sometimes GitHub starts to include things. Okay. <laughs> All right, so it sounds like maybe they're starting to turn it on automatically. Okay, hello. Hello. Oh, <laughs> it's Stephen Jacob from Rochester Institute of yeah. Technology. How much? <laughs> All right, okay, good to see you.
<laughs> Steven, this is um, Kelly Blinko from Auckland University, New Zealand. Um, Bianca and Marcos from Northern Arizona. So it's a very academic crowd in the room. <laughs> no one's threatening to show up. Hmm? Is it Mike Nolan is threatening to show up? Oh, okay. So, uh, so dependent bots, things like that. That's a that's a good idea. Um, The um, Libyer metric that you have, you yeah. could use that in like a hierarchy as well, right? Like what are the Libyer of yeah. your dependencies? So maybe yeah. some metric yeah. for yeah. each of your dependencies on how outdated their dependencies are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have like we have pretty good data um, on that. Like we can, when we run a project, we calculate the Libyers for every import. Um, so it's like if I run it every week, I've got like Libier data. And you can see trends and things like that. Mm. Um, but when it comes to fixing these things, I still I still feel like most open source projects that are not large scale CNCF type things struggle to have the resources to actually resolve all of these dependency mm -hmm. aging problems in a timely manner. What about, this is a question, like have you combined any of these types of dependency metrics with looking at your community metrics that you have, like the community health of your dependencies, does that matter? It's not necessarily from a vulnerability standpoint, but more, you What know, is the it, relationship between community health factors like pull request acceptance rates and issue response times and the, the extent to which the dependencies on a project are aging um, continuously? Right. Yeah. 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 And I haven't done that, but that's a really good idea. Like I have all the data. <laughs> so a million. Yeah, that's a good idea. That would be a really interesting correlation to do on a large scale. It's a good suggestion. Have you ever seen the community architecture assignment we have our kids do? Um, I haven't, but I I wasn't accepted to RIT, so. No, but, yeah. um, it just struck me that I should probably send you that to show them what we have them look at to see. Or, can you describe it a little bit for the people? Um, so I teach um, online. I, I forgot there were people. There's online. a microphone by you, I think. Yes, that. I see that. I probably wouldn't have hit you if I remembered there were people online. Um, so <laughs> we have this. Uh, I, I've been teaching open source contribution at RIT for about 14 years, and then we opened an OSPO two years ago. And so we have students run large scale community architecture um, assignments. So I'm just going to try to find it as I sit here with my phone. Oh, but it, it has them look at not only like these days uh, a Baturgia scan, but we have them go through maybe 10 or 15 pieces and we have them do blog posts on what they found and we have them do that three times since, um, since Working in Public came out. We have each group do, a, do one on a you know, one on a stadium and one on a federation and one on a, not the toy, but the, what's the third or fourth one she does? Stadium, toy. What is, what is, do, do you know working in public at all? Working, oh yeah, and Nadia Eggballs? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. she, she okay. has these four categories, right? Yeah, okay, okay. So we have them do that. Um, I'm just gonna sit down because it feels really weird lording over you on my feet. Right, it's probably going to take me a minute to find this thing because I don't have a laptop and because my brain is essentially dead. But I will. But list. essentially, you take the four categories that are naughty egg balls. Well, we we have them run through fifteen different categories of stuff, and we have them do one each on a, so they see the difference on that, and that's their training to then go do their own. When they're trying to figure out what pro projects to contribute to by the end of the semester, they will have run through it with a group three times so they can say, oh, that sounded like a great project, but now that I look at it, it's a train wreck, so maybe I don't want to try to contribute to that. Oh, that sounds like a pretty interesting way to have students start to explore 
open source. Yeah, it's, it's because we're not, my students aren't exclusively CS or SE students. Right. Right there, they're all across the board. So the traditional, if you will, um, teaching open source community way of getting students lost, productively lost in a large code base doesn't work if some of your students aren't SE or CS students. Right. So, and, and so in general, those classes and the summer of code that Saeed started that other people are going to start to adopt, they pick one partner project and they will hop onto stuff and do team assaults of various upgrades or, or improvements or fixing dependencies or whatever. My students learn in a group how to figure out what would be a good group to work with. Okay. And then they go and do it on their own. And, so it connects and they, to so the idea of uh, looking at community health as a sort of to see how that corresponds with dependency maintenance. Or, or even just, is this a community I want to work with? Right. Right. I, I am a newbie student or a semi-experienced student. I heard about this FOSS project. While it sounds like something I'd like to contribute to, well, am I going to be spending weeks beating my head against the wall, or is it a place full of trolls? Or, you know, does this look like a community that's going to be responsive to my assistance? So that's, um, that's kind of like the thought process behind that. Callaway um, coefficient of fail is part of their, uh, do you remember that? I don't. Oh, God, Tom Callaway, spot, did this, this huge. Tom Callaway, he's, he's at Red Hat, right? Well, he would, he's now at AWS, but he was at Red Hat for yeah. a very long time. And so yeah, he, I met him at Red Hat, but I didn't know, the Callaway what is it called? The Callaway coefficient of fail. Okay. This is a is, real thing, or it's... this is this is a blog post he put together that was kind of a tongue in cheek. Um, how you know you're doing open source right or wrong, and it is, it is old. Mm -hmm. um, so that, like one of the pieces of it, if you're on Windows, you get X points of fail um, right away. So <laughs> he's, we we don't use that um, yeah, yeah, quite that's... as one of the things we do anymore. But well, I mean, I, yeah. Certainly, certain kind, certain languages are not very friendly on Windows. All right, here we go. Commarch public assignment. I finally found it. It's opening up. So we run Cauldron. They calculate uh, Callaway's coefficient of fail, fail. They look at the project's IRC channel if it has it. They look at the source code repository. They look at the mail list archive. They look at the docs. They look at what other other comms channels that the project uses, and they look at the project website and or blog, and then they try to answer a whole list of questions that we have. Is uh, history, purpose, and goals of the project? What was the initial commit, the latest commit? Is it a you know benevolent, benevolent dictator for life or another structure? What's the structure? And obviously now that we use these egg ball categories, some of that's already pre-answered. What's the turnover in the core team, right? Is it the same 20%? Are they stay the same over time? You know, who's, who's got how, where do the unique knowledge, highest amounts of unique knowledge lie in the project? Um, mm. Who has commit access? You know, how many total? Who approves patches? How many people? Who's responsible for quality control and bug repair? Front and back end developers, are they the same? Are they different? Um, I'll read through the Callaway coefficient of does, fail. Does mail. Callaway's coefficient have anything about it, dependencies? It does. Um, I think so, yeah. Um, what are the major bugs or problems that have risen during development? How is the project participation trending? Would the project survive if the BDFL was hit by a bus, yes or no? Would the project survive if the core team or the most active 20% left the project? Mm -hmm. Do they have official onboarding in place? Do they have documentation available? How good is it? These do sound a lot like the things we measure in chaos. Like, right. But yeah, so, but, yeah. but we have. So I guess that comes. I guess it's all from Callaway. <laughs> no, no, not all that. Not all that is from Callaway. The Callaway thing was kind of satirical, but right. to give you the Callaway coefficient of fail, um, if it will load. Da -da -da. And of course, it doesn't load. It's it's something you can Google. It's okay. Um, but that's the 
that's what we have them do. We do cauldron because it's easier for them, right? They yeah, just, just turn it on. Put in a URL, boom, because we're not we're not looking for them to Monitor develop things over this time. Stuff. We're looking yeah. for them to do a quick scan to see whether this makes sense or not. Okay. So kind of what I'm, the you know, things I've heard are looking at Dependabot sort of as a level of responsiveness to the dependencies that change. Um, there's, a, there's a system called CVEs, which most of you are probably aware of. And so some of these metrics are intended to um, sort of not rely on the CVE process, but simply to help a project understand where they're at and by maintaining sort of up-to-dateness, uh, long-standing issues that appear later, things like heart bleed or the log4j issue that occurred. If you were maintaining a certain degree of currency, you wouldn't have been susceptible to those specific issues. And there's a sort of a hypothesis that's untested that if you do maintain a certain degree of currency with your dependencies, that you're less likely to be tripped up by uh, some long-standing vulnerability that only is identified years after it's already been around. Um, and, and but of course if you can you know tie if you can be aware of CVEs, if you have a full software bill of materials and you know what all of your dependencies are, then anytime a CVE is issued, you should be able to query that list of dependencies and know if your project is susceptible. Um, which is, you know, obviously depend about does some of that for you. It's kind of to some degree, what Dependabot does. It's, uh, Dependabot doesn't catch stuff for every language, though. Yeah. The Callaway coefficient of fail original blog post is now in your email box. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm feeling like a blog post like the Goggins proxy of fail subsuming Callaway might be in order. Anybody else have any thoughts on dependencies? Anything else you want to bring to the table? Is there anyone, any questions online, or is anybody still online? <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, I, th I think if, if there's no further discussion, I will just say thank you for coming. and. You all come back now, you hear? <laughs> <laughs>